Welcome on this gorgeous day, this bright, sunshiny day, um, to the Craneway Pavilion, which was a four plant um, making Jeeps back in the day, um, contributing to our war effort. Um, historical place and uh, what, a, what a beautiful place on the bay. Um, very, I'm very happy to be here with all of you, um, representing the trust and celebrating our Rosie and celebrating all of our home front workers. So I wanna give a special welcome to all the ladies and gentlemen who were able to join us today and introduce a few of them to you. Of course, our guest speaker today, May Pryor, you'll hear more about her in a little bit. We have Marion Wynn, who was a welder in the Kaiser Shipyards, welcome. We have Marion Sousa, who's a draftsman for Kaiser. We have Mary Torres, who was a journeyman welder. Hey. Yay. <laughs> um, we're also very happy to have Pearl Harbor survivor Chuck Kohler with us today. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Thank you. 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 We have some other special guests. Um, is Kathleen Farley here from Sons and Daughters of Pearl Harbor? I'm not sure if I saw her. Um, uh, we also have um, some other some other uh, guests from the area. Uh, Uche Uwahima. Welcome, thank you. From uh, Assembly Member Buffy Wick's office. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're also very proud to have um, two traveling guests from the Boilermakers who are with us today, uh, Erica Stewart. <laughs> Erica's a real dealer, uh, once a welder, always a welder, she says. Um, <laughs> now she's an international representative for the Boilermakers, and we're so happy you were able to, to make the journey to join us for a special occasion. Um, and also Amy Weiser, who's um, Director of Communications for the Boilermakers. Thank you both for, for being um, here to celebrate. Is there anyone else that we needed to? What? Yes, we do. Naomi is here. Oh, Na thank you. Hi, Naomi Torres, the Acting Superintendent of the, of the Park. So, Acting uh, Superintendent of Rosie the Riveter, World War II, Homefront National Historic Park. Wow. Oh, it usually takes a note for me to remember all the words. But, um, but uh, really great. Very conveniently located, the visitor center right next door. There's a lot more to the park. Um, if you get a ch chance to visit some of the other properties, and we'd love to, to talk to you about that um, at another time. And we're also um, especially happy to have uh, Tammy Brumley here today, who's our Rosie Wrangler. Ooh. And that's because she wrangled Yay, all the time. She's been working weeks ago. Um, Tammy has been working really hard to organize uh, the Rosie's trip to Pearl Harbor for the upcoming celebration of the 80th anniversary. So thank you. Thank you, Tammy. It's almost, it's almost your bedtime, ladies. It's almost time to go. Um, so we do want to get started. I just want to say personally that. Um, this is uh, your service, all of you who served on the home front and who served um, uh, in our armed forces is special to me. Um, about this time 80 years ago, excuse me, sorry. About this time 80 years ago, my parents were living and working in Kansas. They were high school sweethearts and little did they know how much their world was about to change. So right after Pearl Harbor, um, my father enlisted and my parents were married in the summer of, two, summer of 42 and it was all a whirlwind after that. Um, my sister was born 
I think a year and a half later, and I was born 20 years later, and there were four, four other in between. So um, I was not, um, you know, part of the, the World War um, II generation um, of my family, but I am a history major, and it's very important to me um, personally and academically, and I'm just in awe of you all. So thank you all for your service. <laughs> Now, I'd like to talk about Rosie Presents. Oh, thank you. So, so also, this event, I just want to say, this event is part of Rosie Presents, which is um, a new program for us that, um, as we are able to bring you special guest speakers and events and other, uh, other presentations, we will be doing that, um, some of them in person and some online, and we already have a lineup of great speakers, um, and uh, who look forward to sharing their expertise on a variety of issues. And we look forward to joining together again as, as often as we can. And uh, thank you for being part of uh, our event today. So now I would like to introduce uh, the uh, executive director of Rosie the Riveter Trust, Sarah Fisher. Woo! Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Like my colleague, Michelle Fidelli said, we're so thrilled to bring this very special woman here today. And um, let me read a little introduction. Okay. There is so much to be said to introduce May Cryer. So I think it's best to quote from a recent, well, let's see, July 21st, 2020, Kelly Gormley wrote in the Washington Post article, and this is just a teaser, because then I'm gonna call up May. May Cryer fondly reminisces about her favorite bandana she wore while toiling away at the Boeing factory where she helped make B-17 and B-29 warplanes as a teenage girl during World War II. Cryer, now 95, often had to retie the burgundy knit bandana when it slipped off their head during her shift at the Seattle factory. There, she and other young female workers wore the kerchiefs to protect their hair from getting caught in machines and yanked out of their scalps. For many years, Cryer had paid tribute to her beloved Rosie the Riveters by making red bandanas with white polka dots, a style shown in J. Howard Miller's iconic Rosie the Riveter We Can Do It poster for Westinghouse Electric. Since the war against the novel coronavirus started, Cryer shifted her energy from making Rosie bandanas to Rosie face masks cut from the same cotton cloth. May Cryer is a real life Rosie the Riveter one of about five million civilian women who served in the defense industry and elsewhere in the commercial sector during World War II. The women took the vacated jobs of men who joined the military and went abroad to fight. May is joining us right before heading out tomorrow to Pearl Harbor with Rosie Marion Wynn for the 80th commemoration of Pearl Harbor, and we're so pleased to welcome you to the stage. May, will you come up? I will, if I can walk. Hello, Sarah. I just met Sarah just lately. <laughs> We're thinking this now is the best chair for you to sit in. Okay. Uh, the other one's going and whoever feels comfortable, do you, do you want to hold this? You just hold it tight. So you can take your mask off. Yep. Okay. Hi. <laughs> so, May, if you, if you need a starting question, ask me, or you can just go right ahead and tell us what is on your plate these days. I'm just so proud of your women, especially you, and the men too. But when we open those doors for women, it's absolutely amazing what you have done with your lives. 
But my, even more important is what it's doing to our young girls. I, I was on a program not too long ago with a, uh, it was Engineer Week, and I was amazed to see how many of our young girls are into engineering that have dreams of becoming astronauts. Now, how could you imagine this ever would happen a few years ago? I said, year, years ago, we couldn't even imagine uh, a, a woman astronaut or even being into science. And I think, ladies, we've opened so many doors, and I'm so proud of all of you. I said, you know, it takes every one of us to do these jobs. I had the opportunity to speak at the Philadelphia Police Department just about four weeks ago, and it was a great subject because in our day, we never dreamt of a woman cop. I don't know whether you ever knew of one, but back before the war, I don't think there was ever a woman policeman. And I got to speak about the Philadelphia Commissioner of Police. She's a woman, and I said, what a great thing that is. And she's a woman of color. What a giant step that is for our society. I just think that's absolutely great. And I, you know, it's just, um, these are the things that we did, not even realizing what we were doing. We didn't know the doors we were opening. And when I spoke in New York one night, a lady came up to me and she says to me, you know, she said, if it hadn't been for you women, I wouldn't be a doctor today. And you know, we know there's women be, be, can, had become doctors, but that's so rewarding to hear. You know, we opened the doors, but what you women are doing is absolutely great. I'm just so proud of all of you. And our young military, yes, go ahead. I think that's great that what you women are doing. And our young military, I just love being with our young military of what the young people, men and women, there's just as many, well, not as many, but there's so many young women in it now. And I think it just makes me proud to see that women are, are equal, that's what I like, you know. They asked me if I'm a liberal, and I said, I'm not a liberal, I'm a re equal right. Why don't we get the same pay as a man, you know, for doing the same job, which we didn't get during the war, you know. So that's what I promote, that's what I do. And I love work, you know, going to schools for the young students, young, especially young girls. I tell them, you know, follow your dream. Don't think that just because he's a man, he can do it better. You've got a brain too, you know, use it. And I think that's great. The girls are picking up on that and they're going through with all of that. I think that's great. Thank you. Um, May, can you talk about, um, you and I are, I feel very privileged because I am, I was asked to be part of the committee to support the design of the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor. Now, can you, can you just talk a little bit about your process? Like, what, who sparked the idea that Rosie the Riveters, you know, will go and, and you'll start knocking on doors and writing letters asking for this Congre Congressional Gold Medal of Honor? Can you talk a little bit about that process and then where we are today, catch us up? Well, when uh, Senator Casey took it to the, uh, he was on C-SPAN, so I got to watch all of it. He brought me up through half of the program when, the, when we had enough co-sponsors to get the bill. And afterwards, he called me and he said, May, how do you feel about now that you've got the Congressional Gold Medal? And I said, you know, you can't put it into words. You work for so many years and all of a sudden it happens. But I said the journey getting there, the journey getting there was just absolutely great with all the wonderful people we met. And you know, it takes every one of you to get a, a, a medal like that. It can't be one or two. And I just think it's outstanding. And to think we got it, I said, I'm just so pleased, I'm so proud. I think that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> no small feat to get a Congressional Gold Medal on um, And now we're in the design stage. And so, and now you're working with the Mint Department to, to help the artist design something that encapsulates what, what this gold medal is for. Can you talk a little bit about how strongly you feel about the diversity being illustrated? Yes, we do. Uh, at Phyllis Design, the head of the medal, we all agreed we want every woman of every race on that head medal, or the head of the medal, which was great. But we were having trouble with the trademark to put Rosie the Riveter on the back of uh, Westinghouse, or somehow or other the attorneys couldn't get the trade, uh, to use that trademark. So just recently, I came up with one I seen I thought was beautiful. It showed a woman with the wrench, it showed the, the fighting man, and it showed one of the military equipment, and I thought it fit, the, it fit just perfect for our, what it included all of us. And I thought it was so great, and they sound like they might use it. Uh, that was the back. Absolutely, absolutely they're gonna use it, and I think that um, 
So just to let you guys know, we, we have these phone meetings with DC with the, and in Philadelphia from the Mint Department. And it's, and it's May, and now Phyllis, who's passed away, Marion's sister, her daughter, Lori, are on the calls. And so they're really being, a, you know, directing what's going on. And it is, I think, you know, May came in with this idea because the Westinghouse, it's hard to know about the trademark there, so they're not going to use it. Um, but not only is, is, I think, your way to be inclusive with the all different races of women, right. but also to choose on the back side to show that it's the women and it was also the men fighting in the war. Right, and I thought, it, was so, very, very I thought it fit so well. We blended so well together. I thought we each had a job to do and we did it well, and I think that is what that medal represents. And I'm pleased that she's going to accept that. And I, I only live a few miles from the Mint in Philadelphia where they are, are renting it. And I asked her would it be possible if I could go and see some of the process. One of my neighbors works at the Mint, so I'm sure I could get in. But I think it would be very, it's, it, all of this has been so interesting. I mean, all the women that, all of you guys, I look at you, so many of you I know, how well we've worked and how long we've worked to get uh, recognition. And I think it's nice. May, this is something that interests me. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, May made over 5,000 masks during the pandemic. Yeah. By hand. Was it an old Singer machine? Was that? The Singer. It was a Singer yeah, machine? Yeah, and, and they sent me a vintage machine. I still haven't got it put together. I don't know what to do with it. I don't need any more stuff. You know, I'm trying to clean out. <laughs> so who here in the audience is wearing one of the masks that May so thank you, thank you for that. She sent them across the United States and probably further to people who asked for it. One of these masks has been put on a robot or a... Well, uh, no, when I was on a, a symposium with the, uh, the CEO, David Calhoun from um, West of Boeing, and Senator Casey, my senator, and uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick. They've all worked with me so well. This has been fabulous. So we did a symposium with eight schools and 100 students, but that was Engineering Week. And afterwards, the uh, uh, CEO of Boeing said, May, stay on. We have a surprise for you. And they said, for your duty of making your masks, he said, we're going to put your face mask and your bandana on our on, on Rosie the Rocketeer that's going into space, into the International Space Station. And he said, they're going to give me a newly minted a Boeing medal for it, too. Isn't that nice? Yeah. It hasn't gone up yet, because it had when it was on them. In fact, they had news with me to, uh, to show me when I was seeing it take place. Uh, but they had problems with gauges or something, so it still hasn't gone up. But the man from CBS that just talked to me, he said they're working with Boeing to find out when it can go up. And you know, I just started this program. I always made bandanas, and, and I just switched over to masks when this happened. And I just send them out to keep our Rosie legacy alive. And I send out, I guess, around 300 to all the different people that had helped us uh, as far as we were. And of course, it went viral. When it went viral, I just thought, how in the world am I all going to do this? And a lady came forward. She said, May, can I help you? God help that lady. She said, I worked her fingers to the bone. <laughs> but it's so rewarding. It's just so rewarding. And I'm happy with, with the way it turned out. May, you are indeed a trailblazer. Huh? And, and, and so here's my question. You, you've done a lot. You, you've, you know, created Sarah, a lot let's, of just say, let's just say I'm persistent. You're, okay, you're persistent. <laughs> you're, so don't give do you, up. Is there just any don't. part of you that wants to be the person that goes to space? The real, a real Rosie that wants to go to space. You, you have this Rosie the Rocketeer going up. Do you ever dream, do you ever think about, wow, do, would you want to be that one sitting in that seat going up to space? No, I have enough trouble keeping my feet on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I love watching it. I lived, I've always loved the space program. But uh, I think it's done wonders for our, uh, our technology and everything. But now when I see these new, uh, like Amazon going up, it's like a toy to them. And that turns, I don't like that because it's important what we're doing, but to use it for recreational purposes, I, I don't. But that's my opinion, not you know, up to what other people feel and think. Right, uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. Now, may you, I think that because of who you are and because you're so well known, 
people are knocking at your door. People are, you know, they, they want you, you're, you know, they, they um, want you for television, for meetings, for a symposium, and you, you have to be choosy, right? You have to sort of choose where you can spend your energy and your time. I know that one is, you're, there is a young woman who is working to get a memorial, a physical memorial on the mall in Washington, D.C. I want the Rosie Ri I want the for statue. For the Riveters, oh, yeah. for statues. Can you tell me about that, what, how you're helping in that area? I don't, I don't, that's one thing I don't know how to approach. Uh, when I was in Washington, I met this major general who was the moderator of our program down there. And she's going to Washington. She said she's going to try to find out for me. But you know, there's so many roses. We got like five or 6,000 of Rosie's Falmos on uh, uh, wrote the, our program. And boy, they helped us get the Congressional Medal. It was great. We named all of the senators and representatives who hadn't signed on. And boy, it was no time at all. Senator Casey said, May, how did you get that so fast? And I said, we were stuck at 29. We needed a 60. And all of a sudden, we had 73. And I said, well, all you have to do is tell the people out there to get after their congressman or their representative. And that's what they did. And boy, we got it in no time at all. So that just goes to show you with numbers how numbers count. You know, and don't, don't give up. Just don't give up, you know? Right. It, it's funny because I started, Senator Casey said it too, I started this 40 years ago. I'm just, I guess I'm a slow learner. I can't get it, I just couldn't get anybody to pick on, up on it at first. And when the paper picked up on it finally, it just snowballed. And I'm so grateful because what my role is is small compared to what we all did. But my role and what I've done, I'm very proud of. I just never gave up. I just, I told Senator Casey when he gave us our first National Rosie Riveter Day, I said, the reason you gave me this day is because you're sick and tired of hearing from me. <laughs> And I'm going to really miss Jackie Spears, and I'm sure all of you are too. She is so great. I don't know. You, everybody has their opinion of their of their representatives, but I've met her on several occasions in Washington, and she's just the most wonderful person. And she really works for what she believes in, and she's such a good represent. When she's going to retire now at the end of her term, and I just dread the thoughts of it because she's one super person that looks out for our constitution and our and our rights. Well, you know, retirement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Retirement does not mean stopping to work. No, she said and that. We're She's very excited to see what she does. That's next. what she says. She's not going to give up on us. But doesn't she deserve a life of her own? She you know, has. she's been so good. She's been so good. She has. Um, okay, I have something else to say. You know, May, it's, uh, it's very special to have you here, here in California and here at the Craneway, right ne next to the Visitor Center and this beautiful National Historical Park. You're very much a part of it. You have been on trips with our Rosaline contingent. I just the met years. them in Washington. You're good friends. <laughs> uh, and Tammy, I, I, I can't praise Tammy enough. Tammy and Greg, they are outstanding. We, um, we wanted to present you and we wanted to recognize you. So we have this plaque for you. I'll show it here. And we're going to mail it to you. But can I read it to you? Yes, please. OK. So this is Rosie the Riveter Trust. In recognition of and appreciation for her relentless and enduring efforts to ensure all Rosie the Riveters receive national recognition, resulting in the awarding of the Congressional Gold Medal and an official Rosie the Riveter Day, Rosie the Riveter Trust is honored to acknowledge May Cryer as an official Rosie ambassador, representing, representing Rosie the Riveter Trust and Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park, given on this day of December 2021. All right, thank you so much. You're the only national park, and that's such a nice honor. Thank you. That's such a nice honor. So we, we will definitely mail that to you. Oh, good, I think. Okay. So let's bring up our fellow uh, Chuck. And before we do, I'm going to just do a short, very short introduction. And then you can join in. You can say how you know Chuck, too. So Chuck Kohler, at 17, Minnesota farm boy Earl Chuck Kohler got his parents' permission to enlist in the Navy. That was in April 1941. 
Assigned to Pearl Harbor, this seaman, first class, was writing a letter to his parents when the first Japanese bomb dropped about 100 feet from the Ford Island office building he was in on December 7th. Chuck Kohler remained in the Navy through the war and two years beyond, and with the Navy Reserve for another eight years. Now, he shares his experiences whenever he can, at schools and civic engagements, for stories in the media and at special events, including the annual Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day beacon lighting on Mount Diablo, which he helped preserve. Chuck, welcome to the stage. Is on. Yep. <laughs> Do you hear me all right? Thank you so much for giving me this chance to stand once again in honor and in remembrance of sunken shipmates and fallen comrades. Thank you. Thank you. I was a 17-year-old ex-farm boy trying to be the very, very best military man that I could be, and I was excited to be assigned the 0800 to 1200 security watch on Fort Island, right in the center of Pearl Harbor, the bullseye of Pearl Harbor, on the morning of December 7th, 1941. I heard the sound of an approaching aircraft, but that's not unusual. We're a naval air station. Airplanes come and go, but not usually on a Sunday, and not that early in the morning. Suddenly, and almost simultaneously, there was a tremendous roar, and bomb fragments, explosion debris, and window glass came crashing into the back of my head, ears, neck, and onto my shoulders. Believe you me, folks, uh, something like that, a bomb can kind of derail your train of thought, if you know what I mean. It took me a little while to get my train of thought back together, but even when I did, I'm still thinking it's one of our friendly air group pilots, hot dogging, crashed. I'm going to go down and see if I could be of some help. When I got down on the lower level, went out through the narrow opening left at the unclosed end of that big rolling steel hangar door, the sound of another aircraft. I looked up, and although it wasn't fully daylight yet, I could make out the uh, form of this airplane in a steep, steep power dive, and I'm seeing what's looking like blinking or flashing lights on the front, hearing strange popping and buzzing sounds all about me, but I don't recognize either of them for what they were. Later, I was told that what I thought was blinking or flashing lights was actually machine gun muzzle flashes, and those popping, buzzing, and whizzing sounds that I was hearing were those machine gun bullets passing through the fuselage of that airplane, or the wings of that airplane that was parked right near to me, then ricocheting off the concrete apron on which it was parked, or off the steel hangar door right behind it. But since I didn't recognize them for what they were, I didn't consider them any danger to me. My interest was drawn to a big old bomb hanging there on the bottom of the fuselage of that diving dive bomber. Suddenly that bomb released, it wobbled as it began to fall, and that airplane began to pull out of his dive. By the time it had completed its dive and was in level flight, I don't think it was more than 100, 150 feet over my head. It's then that I first saw and recognized that big, round, red insignia there on the bottom of the wing. That and the fact that he has just dropped a bomb has convinced me that, oh, these are not the friendly fellows I thought they might be. I turned around and hurried back inside the hangar, hoping I could find someone with a key to the ammo shack. All of our guns and ammunition was locked up, and I wanted to get a gun and some ammo and get at these guys, you know. But as I come in the front door of the hangar, the other few that I was on duty with that morning were heading out the back door. Somebody, I suppose the duty officer, spots me and says, hey, you, follow me. I went after them. I thought, oh, boy, he knows what to do. He's in charge here. We're going to get some guns and ammo and put up a defense here, you know. But I would be very disappointed because when he went out the back door of 54, instead of turning to his right and taking everybody down to get ammo and guns and put up a defense, he instead turned to his left, ran out there somewhere past the other end of the hangar, 
jumped into an on-field construction ditch. Everybody followed, jumped in after him. Since I'm coming in the front door, when they're going out the back door, I'm about the last guy in to that ditch. I hit the bottom of that ditch, got myself stabilized, looked up. I'm looking right at a guy there in his white uniform. The work uniform with those blue Devon Gurry trousers and a blue chambray work shirt. But he was in his white uniform, as so though he was going into Honolulu, going to church or something. Never did find out why he was in his white uniform. But I'm so thankful that he was, because there, on the left sleeve of that uniform, was a petty officer's rating badge. And I recognized the wing, round cannonball, the insignia of an aviation ordinance. Are you the duty ordinance? Yeah. You got a key for the ammo shack? Yeah. Well, let's go get guns and ammo and shoot these blankety blankety blanks, you know? So I hadn't much more than hit the bottom of that ditch, and I and an ordinance were on our way up out of the ditch. Somebody, again, I suppose the duty officer calls out, get back in the ditch. Get back in the ditch. I don't want to be in that ditch. We're military men. We should be putting up a defense. We shouldn't be here in this ditch. Besides, I know this is the beginning of that war that they've been talking about and we've been preparing for. And I'm from a proud family, and I damn well know that if I'm going to lose my life in this battle or any other battle of this war, I would want my family and my country to know that I died fighting, not hiding. We can turn up out that ditch, start to run for the ammo shack. Then I heard the most unexpected military command directed at myself and that ordinance that I thought I would ever hear in the military, especially under those conditions. We weren't running to get away from the action. We were running to get into it. Anyway, somebody, again, I suppose the duty officer shouts, get back in the ditch or I'll put you on report for disobeying a direct order. Hell's bells. Talk about being between a rock and a hard spot. These guys in these airplanes are machine gunning and bombing, trying to destroy as many of our airplanes as they possibly could and maybe kill a few of us as collateral damage and our own duty officer hiding here in the ditch is threatening us with military discipline for one to defend ourselves. I couldn't believe it. With total and complete disregard for the threat of military discipline, with total and complete disregard for the fact that aerial bombs and machine gun bullets were raining down on the hangar to where we were running. We continued to run. We made it to the ammo shack. The ordinance unlocked the door, let himself in. I'm right behind him. What do you want? Give me a 50 caliber machine gun. Now, I'm a recent farm boy. The biggest gun I'm used to firing on a regular basis is a little shoulder-fired 22 caliber rifle. This is not a shoulder-fired gun. This is a fixed mount machine gun. Hell, man, it looked to me like a cannon without wheels, you know. But I took it as best I could, most likely cradled it in my arms, turned, and started for the door. By now, I guess a few other brave souls figured they had no to be in that ditch either, and they had followed us to the ammo shack. The guy coming in the door was somewhat taller than I, huskier built. I just offloaded that machine gun to him saying, here, take it to the PBY parked in front of the 23's hangar. I'll get the ammo. He took it, he looked a bit surprised, but he took it, turned and out the door he went. I turned around and there again, I'm so thankful and grateful for that aviation ordinance man. Because without his cooperation, none of this defense that we were able to set up there on that end of Ford Island could have or would have happened. By the way, that officer shouting there in the ditch should have been the guy that was there leading the attempt to put up a defense. Anyway, I grabbed those two canisters of ammunition, turned and out the door I went. I'm not a runner or sprinter, never have been, but I guarantee you, I beat the guy with a gun to the airplane. He had a heavier load than I did. We were approaching that airplane from the port side, basically southeasterly direction, the same direction about approximately that the attacking aircraft were approaching from. But the ladder to get into the airplane was hanging from the starboard gun blister. I ran around the backside of that airplane, set those canisters down, started up the ladder. I don't think I got more than a couple of rungs when it dawned on me, hey, if I get inside this airplane, am I going to be strong enough to reach down and pull that big old gun up inside? I'm not so sure of that. I'm only 17 years old at the time, weighed about 150 pounds, I guess. 
So anyway, I wasn't sure that I could do that. So I told him, give it to me. You get upside, I'll hand it to you. So he chopped, chopped up that letter, jumped side, turned around, reached down. I got the gun to him somehow, most likely muzzle first, which is the lightest end, but which is also a safety no-no. But I don't think either one of us was thinking much about safety right at that time. I shouted, put it in a port blister. That's the side they're coming from. He turned and disappeared into the fuselage of that airplane. I grabbed the canister of that ammo in my right, left hand, guided myself at the ladder with the right hand, set that canister inside the airplane, back down the ladder, got the second canister, back up the ladder, set it inside, jumped inside, picked those two canisters up, turned, and stepped across to the port gun blister just as he was swinging that mounted gun out and locking it in firing position. I set the canisters down under the gun, flipped the lid open, up at the end of the belt, ready to load thinking he'd have the breach open. But he was just standing there staring skyward. I looked up and here comes another one of those airplanes in a power dive. Same old blinking, flashing lights, man. I couldn't wait on this other guy to get his train of thoughts back together. I just reached over, slid the lock forward, threw the breach open, fed the end of the belt into the loading mechanism, slammed the breach shut, grabbed the charging pin, pulled it back and let it go. Bam, we got around in the chamber. Shoot, I shouted, and he pulled the trigger. Now, I guess he was one of those guys that thought with a machine gun, you don't have to aim. You just point in a general direction and fire away. Because I stood there and watched those tracer bullets fly off harmlessly through empty space somewhere near to where that airplane had just been. I think that's when my country boy, Hunter Instinct, kicked in the gear. I used to shoot jackrabbits on the run, Chinese ringneck pheasants on the fly, no, not with a shotgun, with a 22 caliber rifle. I knew that you had to aim and put that, bar, uh, put that bullet where the target would be when the two of them came together. Back there in the prairie pothole part of Minnesota where I was raised on a farm in the 20s and the 30s, you became a hunter and a gatherer real, real early in life. And you also better become a good shot because being a good shot would oftentimes mean the difference of whether you would or would not have food on the table. I shouted, let me get the next one. He let the gun down, stepped aside. I grabbed it, brought it back up to firing position just as I did. Here comes another one of those airplanes in a steep power dive. Boy, I got a bead and a lead. I continued leading and squeezed the trigger. I continued firing, leading and firing. All the while that airplane come down, completed its power dive, pulled out into level flight past just overhead. I watched those tracer bullets fly through the air. Look, like every one of them went right into the round opening on the front of that old air-cooled dive bomber, then stitched the stitch right down the bottom of the fuselage. Some of you know and remember that following each one of those tracer bullets, there are four regular bullets, another tracer, four more regular. So I know here and I know here that I did some damage to that aircraft, but you're not going to be watching him because he's going away. He's no longer a threat. If you want to survive, you damn well better be looking for the next one that's coming at you. I bring that gun back down and I'm looking for another one in the power dive, but I don't see any power dive. Oh, there's one, there's one out over the channel, maybe two city blocks away, well within the range of a 50 caliber machine gun. He's not in the power dive, but in the steep banking and descending left turn, as though he's lining up to make another machine gun run on the area. Because he's in that banking turn, I can see the cockpit six or eight feet behind the front of that airplane. I figure at that distance and at that speed, if I use the front of that airplane as my aiming point, I'm going to get some rounds into the fuselage, maybe even into the cockpit. And believe you me, folks, if you can get a couple of those slugs bouncing around inside that cockpit with that pilot, you're going to give him something else to think about besides being you a second time. I maintain that lead squeeze or trigger. You know, I don't think I got off more than about maybe a dozen rounds at the most. But I saw at least two of those disappear into that fuselage. And when they did, that airplane did an abrupt rolling light turn and was gone from my field of fire. No more aircraft came back to bomb or to strafe our end of the island that morning. I stayed at that gun. I got the fire short burst at other aircraft as they passed through my limited field of fire on the way to or from other targets. But by now, our own aircraft parked on the ramps and on the apron and adjacent hangar, Building 6, Hangar 1, all of which were between where I was firing from there in front of Building 54 and where the Nevada was heading in the area of Hospital Point. Those airplanes and that hangar were beginning to burn so fiercely, putting up such heavy clouds of black smoke that it just obliterated that field of fire. Fifty years later, I was listening to a news broadcast from Hawaii 
it seems that year that they had made a great effort to locate as many of those pilots as they possibly could who had participated in that raid at Pearl Harbor, who had survived the war, and who were physically able to travel. They brought them to Pearl Harbor for that anniversary. They were interviewing them and asked this one pilot, what part did you play in that raid? Now listen carefully to this. He said, I was the lead pilot of a group of nine aircraft. Our assigned targets were the hangars, the airplanes and the hangars on Ford Island. That's where I was. He said, when I went in for my first run, machine gun, dropped my bomb, I didn't see a soul. It was like the whole island was asleep. But he said, we were surprised how fast they reacted because by the time I had came around and was lining up for a second machine gun run, there was so much defensive fire coming up that I turned and went elsewhere. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chuck. People ask me, how in the world, as a 17-year-old kid, could you do that? Well, maybe they were comparing the 17-year-olds of today with us 17-year-olds then. I can't speak for the city boys, but I can tell you about the farm boys and the mountain boys. We grew up with a rifle in our hand. We used them almost every day, not always for personal protection, but to gather food or whatever. My mother would call me, Earl, I need some meat for dinner. I knew right where to go for it, and I knew how to get it, and I'd get it for her real quick. <laughs> we didn't have refrigeration at that time, so you had to get right from the field to the table almost. Anyway, uh, Chuck, I'm, in I'm, 2010, I, my dear sweet wife, daughter, and son-in-law went back to Pearl Harbor. That's the very first time that I'd been to, back to Pearl Harbor in 64 years. After attending the memorial service that morning, then the rededication of the uh, Arizona Visit, Furbish Visitor Center, we toured that center and looked over some of those artifacts that were left there from that uh, event that many years ago. Then we boarded one of those very first white boats to go out to the USS Arizona Memorial. After we debarked from that boat, walked that ramp that crosses over the hull of that vessel resting there on the bottom of the harbor, look over the side, and know that there are over 900 of those crew members, earthly remains, still down there, still aboard that vessel. I made a solemn promise to those individuals that day that somehow, some way, I would prepare myself so that I could do as I'm doing here today, share that experience with other people so that they would have a better understanding of what their family members, friends, loved ones, or whatever it may have been, may have experienced there that morning. I dreamed about it. I had visions about it. And because you have given me this opportunity to share that experience with you here today. I am living that dream. You have made that vision come true. And I have again kept my promise. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for sharing your story. For those of you who have not yet been to Pearl Harbor, I would encourage you to go there and maybe if you remember what we've done and said here today, maybe it may help you to better understand what is there, the way you may feel, or the things you will see while you are there. For those of you who are looking for a very easy way to honor, a convenient way to honor and to remember, not only those who lost their lives at Pearl Harbor, 
but those who down through the years have stepped forward, donned a uniform, laid their lives on the line to provide, protect, and preserve our liberties and our freedoms. If you will make yourselves available sometime between sunset on each December 7th, sunrise on the 8th, find yourselves a vantage point from where you can see the top of Mount Diablo. If you will stand and watch that beacon as it slowly rotates and sends its broader, brighter, and newer beam of remembrance out across all the valleys below, if you will put yourselves in the right frame of mind, and if you will listen very, very carefully, not only with your ears, but with grateful hearts and respectful minds, then all of those individuals will communicate with you. They will do so in unison, as if with one voice, and their message, their plea, will always be the same. Remember us. Remember us. We gave our lives while in service to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're very, very welcome. Thank you. All of my sunken shipmates, thank you, too. Thank you. Well, I think we're all here as testament, and we hear your story. And I, myself, and I, I think others in the audience that can, we will be out there on the night of the 6th to the morning of the 7th. The 7th to the 8th, December 7th to the 8th, we will be out there and we will be looking for that light. And thank you for all that you're doing to preserve, to preserve the story. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. It was an honor to do it. I would do it again if they asked me, if they would take me. And, and I think that that is something that you and May have in common. And I, I want now, I think we have a few minutes, and I would like to open it up for any questions. Maybe we can go to three questions. And then I think if there's time, people would like a photo opportunity. We have a backdrop over here, and we would like to take some photos, or if you would like to take some photos. Are there any questions from the audience that you would like to ask May or Chuck? Yes. And I'll repeat it. If you say it, I'll repeat it. Could I say a few more words while he's on his way up? No, she's coming oh. right now. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Katie. I am an engineer. Um, I work in the building just down the way. Um, and it's such an honor to me to be able to be an engineer and, li and work on this amazing ground where the, you know, we honor the Rosie. So I was wondering, May, I often give um, talks to younger girls who are thinking about entering engineering or science, and I was wondering what you would have me tell them about your experience and the legacy that you and the other Rosies have set for just, us. Just don't, just don't quit. I mean, that's so important. They don't realize, sometimes they hit stumbling blocks or they make mistakes and they quit. I encourage them, don't. We learn more from our mistakes so often. And if you have a dream, boy, follow it. I mean, we have brains too, you know. <laughs> and I think it's nice to encourage, especially the young people. I mean, the older ones, I look around here and I see how many women, what they've done with their lives since we've opened doors. And uh, I just think it's amazing. I love to see what the women have done with their lives. Thank you. It you were one honor. of them. Thank you. <laughs> I, look at, I look at people like Sarah, uh, Tammy here, Lisa. These are just a few. They've made open doors too. They're holding jobs. 
that normally they, maybe a man would hold, but they're right. They're, they're bringing the women up to a great level, which I love. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you. to be here and talk with you. But I would like to share that through sitting here uh, in the visitor center day in and day out, the story that people share with us, majority of the visitors that come have a connection to World War II and home front efforts. And one thing that touched my heart, it was an ICU nurse who came in not even a month ago, who has a Rosie the Riveter uh, nurse cap. What's and that? A Rosie the Riveter nurse cap, and she would wear it oh. during the pandemic. And she shared how important Rosie the Riveter was to their efforts during COVID. And it still touches me today, you know, right now it's fresh, still fresh, but the importance of this history will live on. I call our health, I call them our modern uh, Rosie the Riveters, all of our healthcare people. They're the new modern Rosies. Yes. And you set that energy as well as the others, uh -huh. as well as the soldiers who have served during World War II. And I would just like to say thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs> Look what you're doing with your life. That's nice. Look what you're doing with your life. I'm Is proud of you. Is there one more question before we break? Yes. Can you? We're recording this. You came in late, but you're you're on camera. My my question was to Mr. Oh. Earl. Uh, okay. Here, could you just take your mask off so we can hear you? Is that uh, what branch of the service did you serve in? And you, I know you uh, named the ships. Uh, I can. I was just kind of curious if you knew you went right which branch of the service. There, you want to take that over there? What branch of the service did you serve in? What? Which branch? Navy. Navy. Yeah. Is I, there any other thing? That, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm about. I thought, though, when you referred to the um, uh, ships as boats, I thought that was a Navy or the Marine Corps one of the two. <laughs> My husband He's is a, a fellow, sailor, He's too. He's a fellow serviceman. He, ser he has served as well. He, he has served. Oh, well, thank you for your service. Yes, thank you. I, I said my, you. my husband was a sailor, too. Yeah. And, and as a rosy man, yeah. as a boilermaker, as a rosy, <laughs> I told the story all the time, all the time. Yes, it, it was, it was nice. It's inspiring to have the young, younger generation, yeah. just like the lady just spoke, right? understanding what rosies are. My apprenticeship coordinator has a son that's three, five years old, and he understands rosies. They were in some uh, place bookstore somewhere, and there was a rosy the river sticker there. Pointed out that was a rosy, and one of the older ladies in the library said, How do you know who was rosy? She was impressed. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, rosies bring about a lot of equality, too, which is so great. I mean, it's so long coming, it's a shame. And we're doing so much to, you know, to honor the women that weren't honored during the war, and they worked side by side with us. Yeah. And it was a shame that they had to wait so long to be honored. Truly so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. We, um, we're going to break, um, and then our guests of honor are going to come off the stage, and you can keep asking questions. And please take advantage of this time to have your photo taken over here. We welcome that. And I do have a gift um, for Chuck. I'm going to give it to him. And also for our other VIPs that are in the audience. Um, the Rosie the Riveter, our ambassadors, who I'm very sweet on, I'm very fond on, and um, to Marion, when I want to say safe travels, as well as you, May, and I know you're in great hands with Tammy and her family, and Lisa. Thanks, 
everyone so much for being here. We really, really appreciate you going and telling the story to someone else that may not know about it, doesn't know that there is a young, handsome man who would <laughs> like to say some more words before we break. <laughs> And this beautiful, incredible woman, May Pryor, who is, you know, surely going to be carving more paths in the near future. So